1960, I was playing at the Jazz Gallery in New York with the uh, Thelonious Smokes Quintet, Charlie Rouse and uh, John Moore and Roy Haynes. Um, this was a job that lasted 16 weeks and was really uh, like a postgraduate uh, college course for me because I knew Monk's music, or I thought I knew it. And, and uh, here was my chance to play it with the monk himself and to really uh, uh, learn something. Well, I, I, I tried as hard as I could, maybe a, even a little too hard. And uh, uh, monk was very helpful to me. He would uh, tell me what not to do. And uh, he would never tell me what to do, but uh, he would, yeah, he would tell me stick to the point and not um, play a lot of uh, weird notes and things just because they're interested me, that, uh, that uh, what I should play, that what I should play should make the other musicians sound good. Well, this, well, this was wonderful advice for me. This is the kind of thing I need. He gave me about 25 tips like that of what not to do and, uh, and how to think about uh, playing. For example, he would say, let's lift the bandstand. And uh, well, after a while, I, uh, you know, I, uh, later on, uh, thinking back on that, I, I see what he meant about a lot of those things where at the time they seemed pretty mysterious remarks to me. But uh, uh, later on, when I had my own band and uh, we began to really lift the bandstand, sometimes we'd get off the ground. And now, to me, the idea of, of off the ground music is very uh, everyday. But when he first made that remark to me in 1960, I thought it was uh, a bit strange, really. I didn't know how, how music could lift a bandstand. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
uh, music it involves uh, 30 or 40 years of interest and activity but I'll uh, sum it up as briefly as I can I come from New York 1934 uh, middle class background Russian Jewish uh, immigrants n not much music in the house some uh, but uh, in New York there was a lot of music around and I heard many different kinds of music and I always liked it and uh, I used to play the piano, but uh, maybe my hands were too small. And then I heard some of the re really great piano players like uh, Art Tatum, uh, well, especially Tatum. And that's when I stopped uh, playing the piano, really, and uh, switched over to the soprano saxophone. Well, I've been working on it for quite a few years now, maybe uh, 33 years. And uh, when I first fell for it, I heard a record of Sidney Bechet playing it, and I, I just really uh, fell, is the only word. It seemed like that was the sound I was looking for. I was only 16 years old, and I didn't know I was looking for a sound, but evidently I had been, and there it was. First as a listener and as a as a uh, well, as a lover, I uh, read all the books about it, listened to all the collected records, and really steeped myself in it. But the saxophone, I uh, found a way to save up some money and went out and, and bought one, knowing really nothing about it, and started to uh, fool around with it myself, uh, even playing the mouthpiece upside down, and were all wrong, and. Uh, uh, it wasn't until I got with Cecil Scott as a teacher that I began to straighten out myself and, and see uh, how to play. After about a couple of years studying with Cecil Scott, I got proficient enough so that he allowed me to sit in when he played with some of the bands. So right away I got experience playing with uh, all the greats from the 20s and the 30s and the 40s who were still active great musicians. These were people like uh, Pee Wee Russell, um, Lou McGarrity, uh, Zuddy Singleton, uh, Pops Foster. And I was just a kid, but I had the wonderful experience of playing with all these guys when I was just uh, coming up. Well, I went along for a few years and I was playing uh, like uh, New Orleans, uh, Kansas City, Chicago. I was going through all the schools. And then uh, soon after that, I met uh, Cecil Taylor. And he uh, plucked me out of the older music and uh, threw me into the avant-garde ocean. And I s stayed swimming furiously in that ocean for six years, following him and trying to catch up with him. were my student period at, uh, where I was learning what I would later do myself. And it's only because of what I learned in the 50s in New York and, and the early 60s that I can do what I do now. Gil Evans, that was another one of my masters. I had a lot of help from a lot of great musicians, but uh, especially the time I spent in Gil Evans' orchestras, because Gil is an absolute magician with an orchestra. To be playing in an orchestra like that is a, 
a great uh, education and inspiration and uh, a source of joy and thrilling colors. It's a fantastic experience. this instrument and uh, after a while I realized that I was all alone that it had been uh, uh, abandoned by the older players and not taken up by the newer players and uh, it was in a state of limbo so this was both uh, fearful and challenging for me I was all alone the field was mine however there was nothing to go by and I had to make it uh, make it in my own fashion in my own way and find my own guides and models and my own music because there was nothing written for it. There was nothing suitable for it. I, I had to find a music that would fit it if I wanted to go on with it. Well, I looked around many years and, and tried to f write my own music, but until I was able to write my own music, I nurtured myself on many other musics, uh, Charlie Parker's, uh, Anton Weber, uh, uh, Ellington, Kurt Weill, uh, standard tunes, old standard tunes, uh, whatever I could find that would fit. And then one day I discovered Thelonious Monk's music, and uh, well, that music really fit the horn and myself, and it was exactly what I was looking for. <laughs> saxophone and on the piano to see how, how it was structured. I thought it was the way to find my own music was going through that music. Fumbling around, uh, Roswell Rudd and I, we formed a quartet, and uh, we just played uh, monk, uh, monk tunes, only monk tunes. We wanted to uh, see what was happening with this music, what it was all about, and why it sounded so good, and why it was so interesting, and why it was so hard to play, and why nobody else was playing it. And uh, we also wanted to see what would happen if you only played one kind of one, uh, that if you did not play all the standard tunes that everybody else was playing, and you played only these tunes, what would, what would that sound like? And also, uh, this was music by a pianist, by a composer, and uh, here we were playing without a piano in the group. Well, all these questions and a thousand others were very interesting to us. This was a laboratory group we had. Uh, nobody wanted to hear about it as far as uh, giving us a job. So we had to invent our own jobs. 
And we played many uh, coffee shops and lofts and various cafes and bars and uh, theaters where we uh, would play for the door. Well, this was a, uh, these were the years of struggle in the early 60s, and uh, New York was getting harder and harder. There was many exciting things in the air, Ornett Coleman, the, the new thing, and uh, uh, the third stream, and, uh, and we were really under the ground. But what we were doing was very interesting, as proven by the fact that 20 years later, it seems even more interesting. So uh, we kept on, and uh, we kept this group going through thin. No, there was no thick at all. It was just thin for three years. And uh, we learned a lot, and there is one record that survives from that period called School Days. And that's what it was for us, the School Days. I think the experience with the playing monks music and getting to the bottom of it and going through it led to the freedom on the other side. And uh, finally, at the end of that long period, I began to uncover my own music and uh, started to write my own pieces, which I'm still playing. the fact that I was alone doing it because I wasn't distracted by anybody else's research. But around 1960, after I'd been playing it for about 10 years, uh, Coltrane took it up. The piano players uh, in the world that I know of are playing modern jazz, and we were both working in the same club opposite each other. I was with Monk, and he was with his own, uh, the, the first quartet he had, and, and there was the, the soprano. So that was the birth of the, of the modern uh, jazz soprano, I think, in, in that club gig right there. The soprano is like the ungrateful uh, child. It's the difficult child of the family, the high, shrill uh, infant. And uh, it's a difficult instrument because it's small and it, it tends to be pinched and out of tune and difficult to control, uh, like hysterical. It has a tendency to go hysterical. I just have to really work on these negative aspects of it and try and tame this like a horse where you keep riding it and keep riding it as a wild horse. And after a while, you get control of it and it starts to respond and, and it starts to cool down. long process. It took me, uh, well, I'm still working on it. It's 33 years now, and I'm still grappling with the instrument's mystery.
to do is to uh, play the way we play. And uh, that's what all the jazz musicians do. They, they play the way they want to play. But um, uh, things were getting tough in the 60s in New York, and there was less and less work to be had. And uh, I was working days, and uh, I couldn't play, uh, I couldn't uh, survive as a musician. So that's when I, I wanted to get out of New York. And uh, uh, when I hit Europe, I saw that there was a, enough work for me so that that's, I could do just that, play and be a musician. And that's what I wanted to do. So I stayed in Europe, and I've been there ever since. I stayed in Europe long enough to form a quartet. And this quartet was the one that broke the barrier for me with the, uh, the freedom in the jazz language at that time. We had been playing tunes and uh, keeping the beat and playing very strictly up, up to that moment. And it was around 1965 that we broke that barrier and we just started to play freely. Well, that's a long story, but uh, we were tired of, of the uh, tunes. We worked on the tunes, and this includes the monk tunes that we worked on so carefully for so many years, we got tired of them after a while. Isn't that funny? So no matter how high the quality of something, you can't dwell on it forever because you get tired of it. You get sick and tired of it. So you have to leave it. So uh, that lasted about a year or so, where we just played completely freely. But uh, that group, you see, one group goes out of another group. I mean, uh, each group is built on the precedent group. It's built on the experience and the sound of the precedent groups. And all these uh, different groups that you have, they ultimately lead to the group that you stay with. And uh, that's the group that I have now, is, is a long, enduring group of uh, 12 years now. And, um, um, well, it's very important to be able to play with the same people all the time, I think, because that way you can make some progress, because they're your friends and they trust you and you trust them, and you have the freedom to uh, take risks together. And uh, uh, the possibility of making magic because you know each other so well and you know the music that you're playing so well that you can achieve... Uh, well, magic is the only word for it, and not every night, but sometimes. So this was my whole quest all these years, was for interesting enough material played by good enough players so as to really uh, find something truly challenging and uh, alive. And I think uh, we've got it now with the current band. Irene A.B., she's got the ear, the golden ear, and uh, my job was to um, bring the song form back into the jazz. And hers is the voice that allowed me to find the way to use the word in the jazz. <laughs>
Watts, the saxophone, we've been together for about 12 years now. And uh, what we do is, a, is an indissoluble unity. It's like uh, two players making one sound. And uh, he always is going to keep me on my toes at all moments. And this is good for me. I need this. <laughs> Oliver Johnson at the drums. You know, at the heart of the jazz is the drums, and so uh, a really good drummer who knows what to play is, is my primary uh, need. And uh, well, Oliver has uh, been with us for about 10 years now, and he's the greatest. Uh, John Jacques Avenel at the bass is uh, our own discovery. We heard them, him when he was just out of his teens, and he's been playing with us a long time in Paris. The key to this band is, of course, the keyboard man, Bobby Few. He's one of the reasons I moved to Paris from Rome, because Bobby Few was one of the flash musicians I met at that time.
Divine, something cosmic happens when it's right, when, when the music really takes place. Well, you're gone. The musician is gone, and it's just like, um, well, it's like paradise, you know. Paradise must be like that. Anyway, uh, to a musician, all really great music is paradise. So uh, the years I spent with uh, Cecil and with uh, Gill and with Monk, well, when the music really got off the ground and the bandstand was lifted, it was really, truly wonderful. And uh, those are the kind of uh, values that I try and uh, keep today with my own band. And we're trying to get off the ground in that same way. And sometimes when the music really gets together and sounds right, well, it's, it's truly a, that same kind of lift and the people feel it as well, too. And I guess that's what the music is all about, really. Thank you very much. Irene Aby, Irene Aby, voice, voice and string. Steve Potts, saxophone, Steve Potts. Bobby Few at the piano, Bobby Few. John Jack Avenel, bass. Thank you. Oliver Johnson drums. Thank you very much. Thank you. Give a big round of applause for Mr. Steve Lacey. Steve Lacey, the boss, the boss, Mr. the boss, the boss. 